Good morning. So I'm the presenter this morning. Kathy has prepared the service for us, and I believe she is in Dodds Land Plenty or in another community. But she was kind enough to let us use her service so we could continue today with our live stream. <clears throat> um, announcements. I wish I had some, but I believe next week is Janine and then Shauna, and then Marge is going to do communion for us this month, later in May. So we look forward to that. And I'll ask Shauna for our minute for mission. In emergencies whether floods, explosions, or viruses, the United Church often launches appeals, and thankfully, our generous church members step up to offer support. When COVID-19 struck, the United Church asked members to help those most affected by the virus. Together, we raised over $280,000 to support those around the world who are struggling because of the pandemic. Your gifts have provided life-saving food, medical equipment, sanitation, and health information. Did you know that it is because of your regular mission and service gifts that we are able to respond so quickly when emergencies strike? Over the years, your reliable mission and service gifts have helped our church develop a network of trusted partnerships across the globe. In turn, that means we know exactly who to work with in times of crisis so your gifts are directed where they're needed most. 880,000 people in Zambia heard life-saving health and safety messages through radio programs and print materials. 7,500 7, households in sub-Saharan Africa now have quality seeds to grow nutritious fruits, vegetables, and cereals and 150 community seed banks were created through which seeds will be distributed to 15,000 families. 4,000 families received vouchers for hygiene kits and nutritious food in Syria and Lebanon. That's just some of the partnership impact of what Mission and Service has done. These projects continue to make a difference in the midst of the pandemic. We look forward to sharing more updates about the good we're doing together. Thank you for your amazing support. Thank you, Shauna. And it is true. I'm so happy that we share these stories because you might think the little bit that you contribute to the offering or the little bit that you put aside for mission and service isn't going to do much. But when you combine it with everybody else's, we're making some dreams possible. All right, let's begin with our service, and the call to worship is in the bulletin, and it's responsive. A new day, a new week is upon us. We, we dedicate, dedicate it to God. God. A new hour of worship is upon us. We dedicate, dedicate it to God. God. A new opportunity is here to become new people in Christ. We, we dedicate, dedicate ourselves, ourselves to God. Come. Now is the time to worship. With hearts and minds, bodies and spirits, let us give our best to God. All honour, glory and praise be to God. And I'll light the Christ candle. Calm our hearts and minds and give us hope in you. This morning, and always, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And all together, our opening prayer. Your abundance fills our lives, O God. Richness overflows, mercy abounds. May our worship this day be abundant in praise rich in gratitude, abounding in love. May our souls be restored, that we might be a blessing to you and all your creations. 
Amen. And our first hymn today in our Voices United is 291, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Boy, I hope we can get back to singing full bore and everyone joining us here in church so my voice can get to where I thought it was. <clears throat> Our prayer of confession, and we'll say this in unison. Dear God, you are the source of all the wonders of the universe, from the majestic mountains to the tiniest of seas. Yet, your divine presence in nature is too often ignored. The gifts you have given so generously are too frequently cast aside. You have always blessed humankind with the purest water, the richest soil, and the warmest sunlight. And yet, we have allowed nature's abundance to be abused or unshared, and your generosity to go unthanked. We confess that we do not always do our part. Plant in us the seeds of hope and love. Help us to scatter your word everywhere we go, 
so that all your creation can blossom and flourish in the rich soil you have provided. We carry the love of God like seeds in our hearts. Each day is an opportunity to nurture the seed and to watch the Spirit of God grow and spread. His unending forgiveness is upon us. Thanks be to God. Amen. So the first and only reading today is from Matthew 13, verses 1 to 9, and then 18 to 23. And when I was at home, I thought that I would use the children's Bible, but I thought I'll look it up when I get to church. And this parable is so familiar. It just didn't feel right not to read from the, te the holy text. That same day, Jesus left the house and went to the lakeside, where he sat down to teach. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it, while the crowd stood on the shore. He used parables to tell them many things. Once there was a man who went out to sow grain. As he scattered the seed in the field, some of it fell along the path, and the birds came up and ate it. Some of it fell on rocky ground where there was little soil. The seeds soon sprouted because the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it burned the young plants, and because the roots had not grown deep enough, the plants soon dried up. Some of the seed fell among thorn bushes, which grew up and choked the plants. But some seeds fell in good soil, and the plants bore grain. Some had 100 grains, <coughs> others 60, <clears throat> pardon me, and others 30. And Jesus concluded, listen then if you have ears. Listen then and learn what the parable of the sower means. Those who hear the message about the kingdom but do not understand it are like the seeds that fell along the path. The evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in them. The seeds that fell on rocky ground stand for those who receive the message gladly as soon as they hear it. But it does not sink into them, and they don't last long. So when trouble or persecution comes because of the message, they give up at once. The seeds that fell among thorn bushes stand for those who hear the message, but the worries about this life and the love for riches choke the message, and they don't bear fruit. And the seeds sown in the good soil stand for those who hear the message and understand it. They bear fruit, some as much as 100, others 60, and others 30. So, of course, the message today is from Kathy Siloski, and it is a personal story of hers. So where I'm reading I or we, it is referring to Kathy. And although parts of it do refer to myself and many of you. So the fertile ground. And, it, and she also posts that this was adapted by J and R Fry. And I believe that was her sister or sister-in-law. Growing up on a farm near Major, Saskatchewan, planting and harvesting has always been a part of my life. When I was old enough to be taken to the garden to watch my mother and, yes, help plant, because she always said little fingers are perfect for planting the little seeds, I started learning to plant first potatoes and then the peas. It instilled in me the lifelong desire to continue to plant seeds. And that's where I waver from this story. <laughs> Yet each time I hold a seed, I am struck with awe at how this tiny, seemingly insignificant particle of matter will, under the right conditions, break through the soil to produce a plant many times its size and provide an abundance of produce beyond my comprehension. Probably most of us have at least had some experience with sowing seeds, watching the tiny plants struggle against many odds, 
nurturing and pruning them to make them strong and healthy, and then at last, having the pleasure of harvesting the fruits of our labor, either in the field crops, vegetables, or in the rainbow of summer's fragrant flowers. However, not all planting experiences culminate in success. Peas were always a favorite vegetable to have in the garden, but early in Kathy's gardening career, year after year, while the pea plants took up lots of space in the garden, the pea pods were not a, as abundant. I've been taught to sow one seed for the worms, one for the birds, and one for me. So I was disappointed and puzzled when these poor results appeared. I particularly recall one spring when I was planting peas and a couple of birds who were nesting nearby were plucking the seeds from the row before I could get them covered up. Even after that, my attempts at producing a pro prolific pea crop resulted in very little for fresh eating and even less for the freezer for winter. What could have gone wrong? Did we have extra hungry birds and worms? Was the seed of poor quality? Were the conditions not right? Was there something wrong with the soil? None of these seemed to be the reason for my pea crop failure. While more recently, the pea production in my garden has increased substantially, there always seems to be something that does not produce as prolifically as I'd hoped. When I was preparing the service for this week, thinking about this reading of the parable of the sower and the seed, I was reminded of the disappointing gardening years I'd experienced, and I began wondering if we disappoint God on occasion with our lack of growth. And I thought how blessed we are to be in the care of the one who sows with unlimited generosity, nurtures with infinite perseverance, and awaits the harvest with unending patience. Thinking about the parable from Matthew, we might wonder what the problem is when seeds are sown but appear to bear little or no fruit. If we look at today's scripture as the parable of the seed, it switches the focus to the soil and begs the question, does the problem perhaps lie with the soil? What kind of soil are we? How do we respond to the seed that is cast into our lives? Do we allow our trials and problems to overwhelm the tender shoots growing within us? Do we decide that because things are not working out for us this way, we think we ought to, the way we think they ought to, that God doesn't care for us and we turn away? Do we allow our ambitions and desires for happiness and material success to be like weeds that can take over our garden and choke out the messages that God sends us through the various events in our daily lives and through the people we encounter? Could it be that we often don't take what we are given seriously? We allow our cares to overwhelm us and to choke out the life of the Spirit. How we respond to the Word of God is key to how fruitful the Gospel is going to be in our lives. And unlike the situation in nature, in which seed and various kinds of soil change, in which seeds and various kinds of soil encounter each other, we do have control over how we receive and carry the Gospel message and we can change the kind of soil we are. We don't have to be passive receivers of the seeds that are sown by God. We don't have to let the seeds lie dormant. We can choose to cultivate them and nurture them. It is within our power to be fertile or infertile soil. None of us is fertile ground for the seeds of the Spirit at all times. Sometimes we are more open to take God's word into our lives with understanding and resourcefulness. At other times, we are like hard-baked clay, and it just flows over and around us, and the seed simply falls away and dies. I wonder if this parable is also called the parable of the sower, because then it focuses our attention on just what it is that God does and how gracious God is. God casts many seeds into our lives intending them to land on good fertile soil and produce abundant fruit. Yet we know, as any farmer knows, some seed will fall where it won't survive. This doesn't prevent a farmer from sowing his seed or stop him from praying for and expecting rain and a good crop. 
God sees even more generously than the best farmer seeds, and God allows the seed to land on the hard path and rocky ground and in amongst the weeds and thistles in our lives in the hope that in those places it will find a place to mature and bear fruit, in the hope that those which prevent or slow growth will be removed, in the hope that the soil might be a little deeper than it first appeared in those rocky places. There is something quite wonderful about God the sower, who sows so generously. Unlike the gardener or farmer, God does not discriminate between the good and bad ground when he goes forth to sow. God does not plant into selected and carefully prepared rows and furrows, but rather scatters the seed with abandon. God knows and accepts that some seed will be lost, some will grow quickly and wither away, and some of it will be strangled. But God sows anyway. And so we should sow the word of God's love as generously as God does, trusting that what we sow will, in the end, produce a harvest, even when it appears that there is little chance for it, even when it appears that every ounce, inch of ground is worthless. And yes, occasionally, we may have to replant the seed, sometimes more than once. But how many times does God replant into our lives? In my experience, until we get it, until we understand that God will never quit trying to get his message through to us, we are God's weak and tender seedlings who grow and become strong from being pruned, from letting our roots grow deeper in times of drought. We may not have chosen some of the hard events in our lives, but we cannot deny that they have made us grow <clears throat> in faith and understanding, and thus we become stronger individuals. God wants to be part of every person's life, but it can't happen when we harden the path to our hearts and refuse to understand God's word, or when we don't cultivate any depth into our faith, and it just springs up and dies without roots. We take our children to church and Sunday school throughout their growing years in the hopes that the seeds of faith are planted, will take root, thrive, and bear fruit. And when many of them wander away from those roots once they leave home, we worry about whether they will ever come back to church or make a connection to a deeper life. Sometimes we of the older generation feel that young people lack depth. But when I have a serious conversation with youth, I'm often impressed and awed at how deeply they think about important values and issues, including faith, whether or not they appear in church on Sunday morning. The roots are indeed there, waiting for a little extra watering and the right conditions to bin, begin greening again. And if we remember that there are other people out there who are sowing seeds too, then there is hope for our children to come back. Often the seeds of our faith are being passed on by people and events in their lives, which we may not even be aware of, and which may come to maturity many years from now. The Spirit of God is in each of us, and sometimes we are the way that the Spirit is being transmitted, without us even being consciously aware of it. Being sowers of the gospel isn't always easy, it means doing things that feel uncomfortable. It means taking action. It involves reaching out to people, serving and caring and risking. This may mean forgiving the person who has wronged us again and again, or standing up for our values and principles, even when it doesn't make us popular with our peers. It can be making an effort to understand the motivation behind seemingly senseless acts of terror or holding out a helping hand, rather than walking past the person who is down and out. It may mean carrying on without recognition when we think we deserve it, or doing more than what we consider to be our share on the committee. It can involve starting on those church renovations with more faith than funds, or carrying on with a project even when we can see little progress. And soon we may wonder whether it's all worth it, 
whether anything of value or meaning is going to come from all our efforts. After all, we already know that much of what we do is wasted. We know what it is like to care, to try and make a difference, and not get anywhere, or not be noticed, or not succeed, or perhaps not even be appreciated. But if this parable is about that, then it doesn't have much new or interesting to say to us. Instead, remember that the point of the parable and the point of what we do is that by the grace of God, the harvest will be great beyond measure, great beyond our comprehension. What God will make of our efforts is more than we can imagine. And yes, some of what we sow won't pr produce anything, but that's all right. The ones who sow, and that's us, don't need to worry about that. The ones who sow are simply called to scatter the seed with reckless abandon, to love and to serve and to trust. The rest will take care of, not because of our abilities, but because of the power of God. This perspective of hope and confidence is the gift of the parable. We are to love and to serve in broadcast fashion, not only to carefully prepare places, knowing full well that most of what we won't, knowing full well that most of what we do won't amount to anything, but trusting nonetheless in the inco incomprehensible abundance of the harvest. Certainly, at least we see it. Much will be wasted. Maybe even our very favorite seed, our best, most self-sacrificing good deed, our smartest remark, our greatest insight, will end up on a rocky path or inside some fat bird. But that is not ours to control. It is not ours to fix. It is not even ours to worry about. Today's parable has a message for us that there is hope for a harvest, that we should not discriminate in our sowing of God's seed, that while there are many kinds of people and many kinds of soil, ultimately the seed that God sows and the seed we cast in God's name will produce. Unlike the peas, tomatoes, and cucumbers in the gardens, with God it is never too late to replant. Each of us and all of us together have at our feet fields to walk and seed to sow. We are called to do that. This parable is a gift to lighten our step and extend our reach. It gives us the wonderful gift of perspective so that we can wave at the birds and smile at the weeds. They are not our concern. Amen. For the love that we offer in God's name will not return to God empty but through God's grace will multiply more abundantly than we can ever imagine. So there are a lot of things in there that you, we probably take for granted and don't realize that, that it is happening, but hopefully we can take it home that someone else is in control and we just have to have faith and trust in that. So with that, we will have our invitation for the offering. And Brenda, do you mind bringing that up for us? And as she brings the offering, many of you may be aware, but as a church board, we decide each year how much of the offering we are going to set aside for mission and service. And then we add that to any special mission and service gifts that we receive as well. Thank you, Brenda. And we'll do our prayer of dedication <clears throat> in unison. You water the earth and spring the seed. You send the sun and grow the grain. You strengthen the arm and sharpen the mind. You are the source of all that is. We return these gifts with grateful thanks so that they may be given to others in love. Amen. And joys and concerns today. 
uh, I know I wanted to put out the joy that our community of Crawford, as people of all ages, how they pull together to make many areas, in many areas, to create vibrant and healthy surroundings for us to live and grow in. And I saw uh, lots of that this weekend with the high school kids coming out and cleaning the community, some of the 4-H kids creating uh, um, a new flower bed out at the reservoir. Our Marion has agreed to come and fix up our peonies so that they will bloom beautifully again this year. I just want to, I just want to say that it, it is so good to see everyone doing something. As little as you may think that it is, it, it con contributes to something that is very beautiful. And I'm not sure, did anybody have any other joys today they wanted to share? Anything you noticed during the week? All right. I want to wait till next week when I have more information, but I might have a new little bundle of joy today. My son and his wife are in the city and things are moving along with their delivery of a new baby. And I hope that will help cheer up my mom, who is in the hospital in uh, St. Paul's. That will be her 13th great-grandchild. I also want to keep in our hearts Marie Knorr. She is, is due in Saskatoon, and they're trying to find some solutions for her problems. And once again, we'll keep Anna. She was uh, Tanya Thiessen's friend. She is still uh, in a coma in in Saskatoon. So we'll keep her in our prayers today. So if you'll pray with me, dear Lord God, I like your parable tries to tell us to be the fertile soil. We still sometimes grumble and complain. When we do help us to remember that everything we have comes from you, that you feed us each day and look after us each night. Thank you, God, for your care. Thank you, gracious God, for always giving us much more than we can earn or deserve. Your love towards us seems reckless, extravagant, and unbelievably gracious. You scatter the seed generously. You give us our lives, our families, our homes, and our friends. You have given us confidence for this day and hope for tomorrow. Forgive us when we consider all of this our right rather than as your gift. Forgive us too for when we have resented the love you show towards others who have not served you as long as us, for when we have been angry because you have brought joy to others. Lord, hear our prayer. Fa Father, you call us to work in your gardens and fields, to reach out to others in your name and bring your healing word, your gentle touch, your embracing love to them. Help us to spread those seeds and be the good soil, ones that seek the lost, ones who are unafraid to see in a stranger the image of Christ, and in a sinner to see a brother or sister. Empower us as individuals and as a church to be the kind of sowers who know and do your will so well that in meeting us, people meet you. Lord, hear our prayer. We also pray today for those around us who are in need, be it in body, mind, soul, or spirit. We pray, O oh God, for those we now name silently or aloud. Lord, hear our prayer. We ask all these things and proclaim your praise and your goodness through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And in the words of Jesus, who taught us to pray together as one family. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us 
and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our second hymn today is Voices United 217, All Creatures of Our God and King. <coughs> 217.
We are the servants of Christ, Christ, the Son of God. We accept the mission of Christ. To be God's people in the world, to be the sowers and the soil and the seed. Our worship ends, our work begins. May the blessing of God nurture us all as we seek to bear fruit. Amen. Thank you everyone for coming this morning and thank you to Long Term Care and Carnegie Haven and anyone in and beyond our community for joining our service. Have a great week.